Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. It's my privilege to be able to continue on with this series, uh, as our host said. Uh, And to start off with, I want to ask all of you a question, a very simple question. Uh, Who here has seen the TV show called The Middle? TV show called The Middle. There's a few hands going up. Uh, If you haven't, you're missing out. Uh, It is just uh, a great uh, comedic uh, look, really, at the average American family. Uh, It is uh, based kind of in uh, the Midwest, in Indiana, and you have uh, the whole episode is kind of narrated by the wife, uh, whose name is Frankie, and her husband, Mike, and they've got three kids, and they're teenagers, and of course, you get all the fun that uh, goes into that. They just, it's it, just a really good spot-on take. The writers are phenomenal uh, at looking at just life and how just, it just seems to just, funny things just seem to happen to us if we take a moment to take a look. And now there's one early episode, uh, I think it's in season one, where Frankie walks in, that's the wife, she walks in, she's got a bundle of mail in her hand, and she g- declares to her husband, she goes, Mike, it's 2009. And he goes, what already? Uh, well, how did that happen? Yeah, Mike, it, it's 2009. And at first you're like, okay, do they just not look at a calendar or what's going on here? Why are they so worried about it's 2009? And then they flash back to happier times when they walk through the front doors of their home with a brand new television and a brand new microwave and a brand new VCR. For those of you that don't know what a VCR is, it's an early version of a DVD player. Right? These tapes you shoved in the front. Anyways, we'll get past that. Anyways, they purchased all of these things with the wonderful clause of no payments until 2009. At that point, they were like, the economy will be better then. We'll be okay, so we can put this on credit. The show returns to the present. Obviously, this is not the case. The family's finances are now teetering on the edge of disaster as all of these payments have come due all at once. Frankie then says this. She says, great. Now with interest, we owe $650 on a VCR that we sold last week at a garage sale for two bucks. Since they're struggling with this financial uh, situation, every penny counts, and she calms the family down, and she goes, you know what? We'll be okay. As long as the dryer lasts, we'll be okay. And of course, in every great comedic moment, you then see the explosion in the background and the dryer fall flat. When I watched this scene with my wife, Mary, we laughed a lot, and not just because it was a great comedic scene, but because we've all been there. At some point in our lives, we have all made a bad financial decision, some impulse buy, an upgrade we really didn't need, or that offer that was just too good to pass up. I mean, really, honey, do we need five turkeys? But it's a good deal. We've all made a decision like that. Unwilling to delay gratification, we use tomorrow's money to finance today's lifestyle. As a culture, we have stopped saving. We have pulled equity out of our homes, and we charge away pretending tomorrow will never come. The problem is, fact of a calendar, tomorrow always comes. At some point, we have to face the reality, and we have to live up and, uh, to the consequences that we have now uh, been forced to deal with or We go to the bank and we apply for another card and we transfer the balance onto that card in the hopes of delaying the consequences. One statistic I read said that we are are more likely to spend a higher amount when we use our credit card than our cash or our debit card. In fact, we'll spend 25% more on a purchase if we put it on credit. And just this past week, there's been uh, uh, a series of articles I've been following. They update on the Canadian uh, Consumer Debt Index. Uh, And the last statistics from the end of June have now come out. They said that debt in Canada has risen to a new record level of $1.67 for every dollar of disposable income we have. So what that means is that after all of our obligations, all of our bills are paid for, we're still in a deficit position. 
We still have to somehow pay back to creditors and whatever, $1.67, and we only have a dollar. It just doesn't make sense. Now, Alexis de Tocqueville, who is a, a French polit political philosopher and historian, uh, traveled to the United States, and this is what he wrote. He said, Americans are extremely eager in the pursuit of immediate material pleasures and are always discontented with the position that they occupy. They think about nothing but ways of changing their lot and bettering it. For people in this frame of mind, every new way of getting wealth more quickly, every machine that lessens work, every means of diminishing the cost of production, every invention which makes pleasures easier or greater, seems the most magnificent accomplishment of the human mind. One usually finds that the love of money is either the chief or secondary motive at the bottom of everything the Americans do. What's crazy is that he wrote that 150 years ago. Not much has changed. And if you think you get out of that because you're Canadian and not American, I'm sorry. The materialistic culture that exists there exists here. We can't get hung up on that. We have advertising that screams at us secrets of simple, organizing, content life. But it doesn't take long for us to realize that those tips and tricks leave us with more to do, more to, more to buy, more to acquire, and more to long for. Our society is seeking simplicity and instead is finding complexity. What we need to do is not just try and seek simplicity. We have to find it. And once we find it, we have to live it. Last week, Pastor Dave started us on a sermon series entitled, Where Everyone Matters. And this one is really close to my heart. And the reason is because this sermon series has everything to do with who we are as a church. As Royal Oak Victory Church, who are we? What are our values? What makes us unique? What makes us passionate? What makes us a loving community that we love to attend week in, week out with Jesus at the center? And what I love about this series and what I love about our core values and the vision we have as a church is these weren't just great ideas that we found on a poster and decided to adopt. This wasn't just the, the newest internet fad. Instead, what we decided to do was pull together all of our congregation, our volunteers over the last three years, our staff, and we looked very closely, not necessarily at who we wanted to be, but who we are. What makes us who we are? What's our culture? What are the things that make us who we are? And we weighed in on that and we valued it. So what I like is the fact that this series is not just something that we're hoping for, not just something that we're working to achieve, but in a lot of ways, it's already who we are. Now today, we're going to be looking at the second of our core values, this one right here, living simply, giving generously. Living simply, giving generously. If we expound on this statement, if we take a look at the whole statement, uh, which is a little bit less easy to memorize, which is why we have the easy one. Uh, this is what it reads. It says, we as a church will faithfully steward our resources in a way that models the reality that we can be free, living a life of simplicity and generosity. And as we see, this flies in direct contrast, in contradiction to the cultural norms that we have as a society. It is who we are as a church. It is who we are also working to be. It is my desire today that uh, you see why this is who we are and why it is so important for us to find this for ourselves, not just as a church, not just as an act that we have corporately, but also personally in your own lives, how living simply and giving generously becomes not just something for the church, but something for each of us. Because we know that when this biblical approach is applied, we have the ability to be free. Now, who here would want to be more financially free? If you're not putting up your hand, you're lying. <laughs> Everybody wants to be more financially free. right? F free from financial pressures. Free from worry. Free from stress. Free from having to owe money on credit cards. And instead, free to use our money to invest in God's purpose, in God's design for our lives. So let's look at each of these aspects in turn. We're going to start with living simply. Living simply. As I briefly touched on, 
Uh, our culture has become obsessed, and maybe unknowingly, with this idea of complexity. We are encouraged we're pushed, we're cajoled, we're bribed to acquire more, thinking that the more stuff that we get, that we're somehow going to fill a hole, we're somehow going to fill this need in our lives. A survey by the National Home Builders Association in the United States said that the average home went from 1,660 square feet in 1973 to 2,400 square feet in 2004. This article then went on to outline that despite this increase in our house sizes, the self-storage industry is booming because we have too much stuff to fit into our ever-increasing house sizes. In 2009, there was an estimated 1.9 billion square feet of self-storage space in the United States. And by 2014, that's just five years it had gone up to 2.63 billion square feet. In May of 2017, one month, Americans spent $299 million on self-storage rental fees. $299 million to store stuff we can't even fit into our houses. In one month. In fact, if you've ever seen the A&E show Storage Wars, we now have people fighting over our storage lockers of stuff that we've abandoned because we can't fit it into our houses. Clearly, the complexity approach is not working. Instead, we need to take a look at the opposite approach. We need to look at what it really means to live simply. The definition of simplicity, unsurprisingly enough, is the absence of complexity. But even more than that, if you look at the definition, I love this. Simplicity can be defined as the absence of deceit. It means that we choose to no longer live a life where we're going to give in to the lies that the advertisers try to sell us. It means that we're going to choose to no longer live a life where, where we are okay getting duped into agreements where we can buy now and pay later. Now, it's not about just getting rid of all our stuff per se. Instead, it's about cultivating the disposition, changing our behavior, changing our actions in such a way that, as Richard J. Foster puts it, living a life of joyful unconcern for possessions. In his book, he further writes, Christian simplicity is not just a faddish attempt to respond to the ecological holocaust that threatens to engulf us, nor is it born out of frustration with technological obesity. It is a call given to every, Christ, every Christian. The witness of simplicity is profoundly rooted in biblical tradition and most perfectly exemplified in the life of Jesus Christ. It is a natural and necessary outflow of the good news of the gospel having taken root in our lives. Think about that for a moment. Simplicity is supposed to be a natural and necessary result of our relationship with Jesus. Natural and necessary result of our relationship with Jesus. So what does that look like? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn it with me uh, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Now, Philippians, you're going to find it about halfway through the New Testament. Uh, it's in a grouping of letters by uh, a guy by the name of Paul. Uh, that he writes to various cities, various churches throughout the Roman Empire. So if you can find Romans and Corinthians, uh, eventually you just keep moving, you're going to find Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Now this letter specifically, he's writing to the church at Philippi, and he goes through a whole bunch of stuff. And then right at the end, where we're going to pick it up, he begins to kind of explain and extol uh, his thanksgiving for the church and all they've done. He's kind of wrapping his letter up. And he begins to thank the church for their support. But in this, he outlines one key factor for us to live a life of simplicity. And that's the, this idea of contentment. So we'll start here in verse 10. It says, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content 
with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. If you think about that, it makes sense. If, if we're supposed to live a life of contentment, where the material acquisition question isn't even considered, aren't we just naturally free of its clutches? Paul outlines in this passage that it is something that we have to learn. Right? It's a discipline that must be adopted. So this discipline of simplicity is an inward reality. It's something that we must change within ourselves. We have to change our attitude and our behavior. And what that does is it results in our outward lifestyle. It, it results in what we uh, then go do, right? So if we change our attitude, if we change our mind, when we walk into a mall, instead of us kind of working our way through the stores, figuring out what's available, what's a good deal, and end up walking out with three or $400 worth of stuff we don't really need, we can then walk into the mall and actually just enjoy the walk, right? That's the change in attitude we're talking about. As we live simply, we don't need to enhance our status in society through the acquiring of stuff. And when we change our attitudes and behavior, what we're really doing is we're changing what we focus on. Because simplicity is the gift of an undivided heart, where our entire focus is on Jesus without the distraction of other things and other stuff. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And then as he continues on towards the end of his passage, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God. The two are connected. If we want to remove that stress, if we want to remove that anxiety, if we want to remove that which seems to constantly be holding us back from freedom, we have to seek first the kingdom of God. It's amazing because the passage we just looked at, there's one more verse that Paul says, and he says, for I can do all things, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. We love this verse. We quote it all the time. We put it on our bumper stickers and magnets on our fridge, but we forget the context. The context is he gives us strength in everything when we choose a life of contentment and simplicity. He knows it's going to be a fight. He knows it's a struggle we're going to have. And I'm not saying that God doesn't give us the strength in every aspect of our life. What I'm saying is what Paul is talking about here specifically is that through the strength of Jesus Christ, we have the ability to move past complexity. Having the discipline of simplicity in the midst of our culture requires a lot of work. That's why it's called a discipline. Hebrews 13.5 reiterates this when it says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Again, we love this verse and we constantly pull it out of context. He's saying that when we're striving to be content, he never leaves us. When we strive for simplicity, he's right there beside us. It starts and ends with our connection with Jesus. For some of us, that means that for us to get past our, our debt-filled lives, our stress-filled lives, our anxious lives, it means we're going to have to step closer into Jesus. We're going to have to spend more time with Him, seeking out His wisdom, seeking out His strength to be able to move past that aspect of our culture that wants us to acquire more, to have more, the bigger house, the better car. And I know for me, this is one that I've actually struggled with. I actually told uh, my sister-in-law, Laura, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was actually earlier this week, I said, you know what? I wish we had had a hailstorm this summer like we normally do because I really need a new car. <laughs> and then I caught myself and said, you know what? Other than a little bit of rust, there's nothing wrong with my car. Right? That's the culture that we're fighting against. That's why we have to seek God out, seek that relationship with Jesus in our life and begin to live more simple. Right? Jesus even refers it to living childlike. Right? For those of you that have never entered into that relationship with Jesus, I'd encourage you to do so. 
because it is in that relationship that we gain the strength, that we gain the ability, we gain the wisdom to be able to combat this, this cultural interference in our lives and in our minds that constantly holds us back. And if you want more information, you want more uh, you know, questions that you want answered uh, in regards to what it means to walk a life with Jesus, what it means to accept Him in your life, we have our new uh, I've Said Yes station over on this side. You'll see it here on on the left of me, the right side of the room. And we have a team there that would love to meet you at the end of the service to be able to answer any questions you have, to give you resources, to help you along in that journey with Jesus, because it is that important. It's the most important decision you'll make in your entire life, and we want to help you along that journey. And in our context, simplicity is impossible without Him. Now, as I've talked about living simply as individuals, this is also our core value as a church. This is something we just do naturally as a corporate body. But what does that mean? Let me just give you some examples. First, that means that we budget, and I know a lot of people don't like that word, but we budget very carefully and we stick to that budget as a church. There is accountability for the staff, for the ministry area leaders to be fiscally prudent, to be responsible with the money, with the contributions that you gift us with every week. And believe me, the area leaders don't want to get on my bad side. I'm an accountant by background. I like budgets. I find them fun. I know it's hard to believe. Talk to another accountant. They'll get it. What this means is that when it comes to being fiscally responsible, we have never in the last 20 years since Pastor Dave and Clarice have been leading this church got on this stage and asked for money because of a budgetary shortfall. That's, that's not common. It has never happened, and I'm not putting words in Pastor Dave's mouth. He has said this from this stage. It is something we will never do. We promise to be good stewards of the finances that you put into our care. Secondly, we monitor our debt very closely. The only debt that we have is on this auditorium. This was the last addition to this building. It is the only debt that we have. But even in uncertain economic times, like it has been for the last couple of years, we have been very aggressively working to pay off our debt as quickly as possible. In the last 20 months, and I'm sure anybody that has lived in Alberta for those 20 months knows that it has not been stable. It has been an interesting roller coaster for many of us. But in the last 20 months... We have paid off over $239,000 on our mortgage. It's definitely something we're celebrating. I just, I, I love it. I just, I love numbers. Anyways, I'll get moved past that. This value for us as a church is deep. It's part of our culture. Living simply is who we are. As we continue, I want to look at the second aspect of this. So we've talked about living simply. I want to look at the second half, which is giving generously. Dave Ramsey, who's the creator of Financial Peace, is also a well-known radio contributor, has this great line. He says, what can you do when you're debt-free? Anything you want. Whether we realize it or not, the current cultural norm of debt accumulation is not providing us with the freedom we think it is. In fact, it's doing the exact opposite. And let me be clear, I'm going to address the elephant in the room. The church, for the longest time, has avoided the topic of money because of an overreaction of hundreds of years of church history where the church did not act as a faithful steward. I love history, and, but unfortunately, church history is filled with a lot of unfortunate stories where human wants and desires overrode the teaching of the Bible. And the church, when it came to money, sometimes caused harm when they were supposed to be helping. But as a church, we cannot avoid this topic. It's not like we can look at this idea of money and just avoid it altogether, especially because of how much the Bible talks about it. Jesus talks about it. Even in his own ministry, he devotes entire sections of his teaching to money. In fact, I don't have the, uh, the statistic right in front of me, but if you break the Bible down by theme, money is actually one of the top topics of the Bible. 
Proverbs has more than one verse that outlines the consequences of debt, even going as far as calling uh, debt slavery. It doesn't mince words. And Jesus talked a lot about the heart of generosity because it flows out of the same aspect of simplicity that is a relationship with Him. When it comes down to it, our ability to be generous is directly related to how much we trust God to be our source and our provider, not how much we earn, not how much our paycheck is. It's why a majority of us uh, have struggled with this, uh, and maybe many of us have not yet overcome that struggle, because it doesn't matter the level of income. I've talked to people that make almost nothing, and they struggle with tithing. I've talked to people that make a lot of money, and they struggle with tithing. The income number doesn't matter because it comes back to the heart. Fear drives us to think if we give, there might not be enough left over for us. We are afraid to be generous because we lose full control of the situation. What if I don't have enough money to pay the bills? What if I don't have enough money to buy groceries or put gas in the car? Fear, along with a misplaced idea of where our security really comes from, keeps us from being generous and leads us to hoard what we have. Author Adam Hamilton, who's the senior pastor of Church of the Resurrection in Leawood, Kansas, says this in his book, Enough. We were meant to find security in God, but we find it in amassing wealth. We were meant to love people, but instead we compete with them. We were meant to enjoy the simple pleasures of life, but we busy ourselves with pursuing money and things. We were meant to be generous and to share with those in need, but we selfishly hoard our resources for ourselves. There is a sin nature within us. He continues, he says, here's what the devil knows. If he can get you in debt, he can make you a slave. If he can convince you to spend all you have, you'll never authorize offer your tithes to God. Never help the poor as you could have. And never use what you have to do uh, and to accomplish God's purposes. If He can tempt you to become a slave to creditors, you will not know simplicity, generosity, or joy. He will have neutralized your effectiveness for the kingdom and choked the gospel out of your life. The interesting thing is this, from the earliest biblical times, we see that the primary way that people worshipped God was not by singing songs or listening to a sermon, but it was in fact offering the first fruits of their labor to God. The tithes and offerings that were presented to the priest or upon the altar or brought to the temple or brought to the church, that was the central act of worship. It's not hard to see why, though, because when the gift is given, it forces us to focus on the true source of our supply. The very act of generosity, whether it's hesitant and reluctant or whether we do it willingly, that breeds more generosity. Proverbs 11 says it like this, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Winston Churchill said it like this. He said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. For us as a church, like I said, this is is part of who we are, right? For many of us in this room, this shouldn't be a hard message because it's already within our culture. It's already who we are as a church. And we practice generosity. And I don't mean just the money that we give away as a church. This church is incredibly generous. Those of you that are in this congregation give sacrificially week in and week out. I mean, last week, Pastor Dave outlined the sheer volume of volunteer hours that is given week in and week out into the ministries of this church. That is an act of generosity. But it goes beyond that to monetary contributions as well. Now, earlier this year, you remember that we did a campaign. It was for the slum schools in India, and our goal was to raise $9,600 to support this slum school for one year, and we thought it would take us all of 2017. We should have known better. From our experience and the generosity of this church, we should have known better. 
as many of you are aware, we had to stop the campaign at the end of May, a full seven months earlier, because we had already exceeded our target by $1,000. And to me, this whole concept of generosity, it, this value hits home personally to me because our MPK, which is our Mission Possible Kids, that's our children's ministry, has worked diligently all year long. They've continued on with this project even after we stopped as, as an adult congregation. MPK has been working to teach the value of generosity to our kids. They've been using creative and inspirational ways to get our kids engaged and it's working. My oldest two kids, which are in the group that does the uh, slum school campaign, uh, they don't see money the way they used to see money. They don't see money as just uh, uh, the ability to get the stuff they want. Now they see it as a real opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. My oldest is also coming to grips with uh, kind of the world around her. And she often comments on how blessed she is compared to those kids around the world. That's incredible to me that at seven years old, she's grasping this concept of giving back. And if you want to take uh, the opportunity, I would encourage you, come on to this side, on the east side of the building. Take a look in that classroom because on the wall, they have these giant pencils that shows how much money they've raised. There was only supposed to be one pencil. They're already on their third. That's four, five, six, seven, and eight-year-old kids that have now raised over $1,000 for their kids in India. This is in our culture. This is who we are. On a broader scale for us as a church, if we look at the 18-month period that ended June 30th, which is the last quarter that closed, we have given over $139,000 to missions. That's something that should be celebrated. That goes well beyond uh, the ministry in this church as well. We're talking just missions, $139,000. That doesn't happen by accident. This is a culture of generosity. By living simply and giving generously, uh, we begin to see these things take effect. And these two are so closely related to one another because they are tied in the basic need for us to be so closely connected with our Creator. Without Jesus, both of these things, living simply and giving generously, are just fleeting hopes rather than realistic opportunities to change our world. When we are good stewards, things change. We as Royal Oak Victory Church practice these principles. They're part of who we are. Jesus himself said this, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. To close, I want us to reflect on two questions. I want you to ponder these questions, and it's these two questions. Am I living simply, and am I giving generously? As you ponder those two questions, I want you to take a look at this video. My name's Don Jenkins. Uh, I've been attending Royal Oak Victory Church, me and my family. Um, I've been attending since 2008. I, I met my wife and we got married in 2011. And uh, we ran the youth group for a while. Glory uh, spearheaded that um, before Dustin and Beth took over. Um, I've been uh, working actually in the financial industry now uh, since about 2008-2009 uh, and then from there I was, uh, I was at the bank and then I got into the investment industry so a bit of a career switch uh, and then my wife uh, currently runs a day home and we had started that, uh, she had started that process about three years ago when my son was born. So one of the most valuable things that I learned in Bible college 
Um, and it, it's very simple, but it's very, I thought it, it really spoke to me. And that was, um, and it was the question, and it was, do you, know how, do you know how you're not greedy? You give. And that really stuck to me. But for the first time uh, in a really long time, about uh, a year ago, um, being in the industry that I am, I, I work as a financial advisor, an investment advisor, uh, and my wife being in a, uh, working in the day home industry, um, you, you only bring in with how many clients that you attract. And, and so if you don't have a lot of clients and her being just starting out uh, with the day home and uh, we weren't, she wasn't at full capacity. Uh, and then also with my job being 100% commission, it, it, income can be very spotty. Uh, it, it's not always consistent. And the summer had really taken its toll on both of us. And in that time period, we, something that we've always consistently have done is you know, set aside our tithes in a separate account. And through traveling uh, and through kind of being absent over the summer, the account balance really had started to go up. And we had some debts that we had that we were wanting to really start paying down and being aggressive with that. And like I said, for the first time, I really started to struggle because I wanted to pay off these debts and I had this really large balance set aside. but for my tithe that was for the Lord and that's that is the most discouraging feeling when you know you're told uh, you're encouraged by people around you that oh just hang in there and nothing comes from it and it's like well how long do I have to hang in there for and that's what's really frustrating and that's why you know that's where the struggle I think really started to come from that it's like we got to get this stuff paid off we got to be more aggressive with this and it's I think there's a, that sense of inadequacy as a husband when you're trying to provide for your family, you're wanting to do better. And when that isn't happening as quickly as you want it to, you want to start taking drastic measures. And for me, that drastic measure was not tithing. My biggest fear in that uh, was that, uh, and it was not just for me, it was for Glory as well. And I mean, she. She really trusted me with our finances and to be making some of those decisions or most of those decisions. Um, she said, you really should talk to somebody about this before you kind of make that decision. And so I uh, talked to Pastor Sheldon, um, which is hard to say because he's my brother-in-law, but uh, you know, he's calling him pastor, but he, he was saying that it, it was very common um, for people my age uh, with a young being a young family um, that it, at this time of life you're really just trying to get your feet under you and you're really trying to get going and uh, he said that it's a very common struggle but to not let it necessarily persuade you and so I waited a little bit longer on that and so what ended up happening is uh, I got my commission check in and I look and the balance had really surprised me because the amount extra that I got paid that month was the exact amount that was in my tithe account. And so I was completely taken back um, because God once again had really proven himself to us. And even with that little doubt that I had, and it was a very much pay your tithe, <laughs> even though I, you know, it's a, that struggle um, was immediately diminished after after seeing that, and it was a okay, God, I, I submit, and uh, and he he really helped us through that. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your pr produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. So that's that's the verse, and I guess that really stuck out to me. We can try to use logic to talk ourselves out of it. But the reality is, it, it requires faith, it requires trust. And so, in, that brings me back to the other question. How do you know that you've conquered greed? Well, you give. It's as simple as that. The interesting thing is, is I don't think this is ever a, a struggle we potentially get past. It's, that's why it's a discipline something we always have to be working on. And it's, it's interesting that um, I had to be reminded of this again this last week. And uh, 
we were coming up on payday and we're going, okay, we're going to be able to, to pay down some debt and, and get used to get some things off our, off our, our, our thing. And I was like, okay, this is great. And then my 11-month-old daughter decided to drop my wife's iPhone and just shatters the screen. And I'm like, okay, here's just, it seems like every month there's something, right? Just the surprise expense. And so we get our paycheck, and for a moment, I thought, you know what? I could keep a portion of this back. I could get my wife the phone, and we'd be all good. And I thought, no, I can't do that. It's, it's not the right thing. I'm going to pay my tithe. So I paid my tithe, and... My wife's trying to struggle. She had to put packing tape on her phone because the screen was so shattered. She was actually getting glass fragments in her finger. And uh, we're like, you know what? Let's just go to the store. We don't have any, any money for this right now, but let's just go to the store, right? And we go to the store, and I, I, right before we walked in, I said, I'm not going to be pressured into anything because we don't have the money to be pressured into anything. I paid the church. That's what I needed to do. And it comes around, and we get to the point where Mary's talking with the sales rep, and I had to take my kids out, and I bring my kids back in, and she's like, here's, here's the deal. And I looked at the paper, and I, I have to admit I was shocked because we were able to get a brand new phone for, like, nothing. I think it ended up costing us something like 40 bucks. I'm like, I can afford 40 bucks. I was expecting to spend, like, 800 uh, so I can afford 40 bucks. But it's just those interesting reminders that when we put our faith, our trust, our hope in God, He never disappoints. He always comes through. And so what I want us to do is I want us to focus this in into a prayer of contentment. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I have a prayer that I want you guys to repeat after me, and then we'll, we'll close in prayer. So I want you to repeat after me. So, Lord, help me to be grateful for what I have. Remember that I don't need most of what I want and that joy is found in simplicity and generosity. So let's pray together. God, I thank you so much, God, for this church. God, I thank you for the culture that is here of generosity. And God, we know that that comes from a relationship with you. God, we know that when we tie into you, when we seek out your wisdom, God, when we follow through with the principles that you have laid before us, God, that blessing and abundance flow. God, and that means generosity. And God, this church is so incredibly generous. So God, I just pray that in each of our own lives, God, when that struggle of financial stability, when that struggle of contentment wants to rise up once again, God, I pray that you would help us to seek you first. God, do not let the worries and stresses overwhelm us, but instead to gain the strength and the wisdom from you. God, we give you this struggle right now. We lay it down once again at your feet. God, we know that there are those in, in our midst, God, that are struggling financially, struggling with their day-to-day, -day, needing new employment, whatever it is. God, we just pray that once again, you would fulfill your promise, you'd fulfill what you have given us, God, and as we seek you, that those answers would come, the provision would come, God, the blessing would come, God, and there would be abundance that flows when we choose to live a life of simplicity. Help us to be content as we give you this time and this dedication. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him a